Labor Minister Dr. Nanda Gopal, who has extensive experience in the labor unions, has testified before the Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry of the deteriorated condition under which sugar workers in Guyana were subjected to during the 1978-1980 period. Dr. Gopal, who was the head of the National Association of Agricultural, Commercial and Industrial Employees, NASI, said the Guyana Trades Union Congress, GTUC, was warned against entering any agreement with the People's National Congress, PNC government, that would result in a blocking of collective bargaining. He told the Commission that despite NASI's staunch position, the GTUC went ahead and entered a minimum wage agreement with the government, which would have taken effect in January 1979, but was breached. Dr. Gopal's evidence addresses the terms of reference that seek to establish the economic atmosphere prior to and immediately following the death of political scholar and working class hero Dr. Walter Rodney. This breach, the Labour Minister said, resulted in fierce industrial action across the sugar belt and was supported by workers in the bauxite and commercial industries, many of whom were beaten and dismissed for protest action. Dr. Gopal, you indicated in paragraph 19 of your statement that the signing of the agreement received mixed reaction from affiliate unions, with the strongest condemnation coming from NASI. Do you care at this point in time to elaborate on what form this strong condemnation coming from NASI took? Yes, ma'am. At the annual delegates conference of the TUC in September of 1977, and even after that, year after year, we pointed to the danger of the agreement being signed and the government being allowed to block collective bargaining by the issuance of instructions to state employers in the main that they should not negotiate anything outside of that. And then came the year 1979, when the agreement which was entered into was dishonored by the state, in that the $14 a day which was to have been implemented in January of 1979 was not implemented. And that established the position that Nasi was absolutely correct, that they should not have gone down that road. He recalled that head of the Clerical Commercial Workers Union, CCW, Gordon Todd, was apprehended by military personnel and flown over the shark-infested Atlantic Ocean and threatened that if he persists with protest action, he would be thrown overboard. Dr. Gopal said several calls were made by credible lawyers such as Ralph Ram Karan and Ashton Chase for Mr. Todd's safe return. He told Chairman of the Commission, Sir Richard Cheltenham, that the oppressive actions taken against the workers at that time came directly from central government since it was believed that the strikes were politically motivated. The minister testified of ruthless actions meted out on protesters by persons clad in uniforms that bear stark semblance to that of the Guyana police force. Ma'am, they were side by side with the police. They were in police vehicles. They were performing or pretending to perform police duties. No, I'm not concerned about them. I'm mm -hmm. concerned to know whether genuine police were there at the same time along with them. Yes, 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 ma'am. Thank yes, you. Yes, genuine police were there. Dr. Gopal. You go on in paragraph 11 of your statement to speak about an incident that occurred on the 10th of August, 1979. At this time, could you give us some details of what occurred on that date? I'm sorry, Council. Uh, before you move on, if I may, you said that, I think it was paragraph 8 or 9, that after Walter Rodney made, started to make frequent visits to the or rather that NASA Paragraph 10. 10, that your headquarters was, became the target of surveillance because of Rodney's frequent visits. Why do you make a connection between the surveillance and the visits? Well, because nothing had happened before that. Nothing had happened before that. 
Even when you had strikes and even so on. Even when we had strikes. Even when we had strikes. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, Councillor. Thank you. No difficulty, madam. Yes, Dr. Gopal. Could you give us the details of what would have occurred on the 10th of August, 1979? Yes, the police descended on the in the headquarters of Nasi. I was there, but on seeing them, I walked through the back door. But I, you can see through to the front, they waved what they consider a warrant, but it was merely a piece of paper. We knew it was not a warrant. <clears throat> and they moved on to search the building Grasp, they grabbed the secretary, asked her to sit and to answer questions, and one of them was concerning my whereabouts. And she indicated that she hadn't seen me. But I walked out of the place and went at a strategic location where I could view what was taking place just by the Court of Appeal. And, and then I saw them... from that vantage point? Yes, and what I saw them observe? moving a number of articles in boxes, and I could have seen clearly that my duplicating machine, the Gestetner machine, was being moved away. And boxes of stationery and other documents have been parked, packed in a police open pickup, open back pickup that was there. And then they walked away with my secretary. Meaning they took her into they custody? They took her into custody. They took her with them and they headed for Ivleri. What was your secretary's name? Bibi, Miss Bibi Khan. And what if anything happened after they took her to Ivleri? After they took her, by that time I got on to Mr. Chase and he sent Mr. Ashton Chase, who was the president of the union and an attorney at law, senior counsel, sent Mr. Charles Ramson to find out where Ms. Khan was, by which time... To find out from whom? To find out from the police, because they would have... And I did see when moving by the Court of Appeal, I saw when the vehicle turned to the vicinity of the seawall. And so I suspected that they had taken her to Ivleri. Dr. Gopal forged a relationship with Dr. Rodney and even though he was not aligned to any political party at that time. He told the Commission's Council that he attended public meetings of the Working People's Alliance and the People's Progressive Party. His recount of disruption at WPA meetings by state aligned forces formed part of a large pool of evidence in this regard. Dr. Gopal, I wish to direct you again to paragraph 14 of your written statement. In this paragraph, you said that I believe that with the continued involvement of NASI in the struggle for democracy and the close alliance forged with both the PPP and the WPA, the heightened militant positions by the WPA invoked the wrath of the PNC government at the time. Could you explain to us what it is you meant when you said the heightened militant positions by the WPA? Well, the WPA had taken issue with every human rights violation at that time. They identified them as they occur. They sensitized the public, either through their publication or through public meetings. And they were not letting up. There was no aspect of violation of human rights that was left unturned, left untouched by the WPA, and that's why I thought they had adopted a more heightened approach, aggressive approach in addressing issues, confronting workers, confronting the Guyanese people generally. And so 
they were giving leadership alongside with the PPP, which was merely operating in the sugar industry. But by and large, a combination of the People's Progressive Party and the WPA in their activities with this for union movement now have brought tremendous pressure, tremendous pressure on the government of the day. Pressure that had never been seen before because they had been successful all along in quelling workers' dissent, in quelling industrial activities, in preventing workers from meeting and people from meeting generally. They were successful, but they were unable during this period. And I think it had all to do with the charisma and with the devotion of Dr. Rodney. The Labour Minister said while the country was economically bankrupt, the food shortage situation was exacerbated and used as a tool of domination by the Burnham regime. He told commissioners that many persons were denigrated. For example, housing was neglected. And the, the statistics show that or your the observation? The statistics would show that. The statistics would show how many homes, how many house lots were allocated, for example how many homes were built during the period 78 to 80, how many housing loans were made available to people as against previous years. I, I'm glad my, uh, my fellow commissioner... And the statistics will show how many schools have been developed, how many improvement of schools took place, how many computer laboratories... We didn't have any then. But whatever was allocated for exercise books, textbooks, and these sort of things in school, clearly there was absolute neglect in these areas, but the military had absolutely no neglect. So the statistics would show how much money was allocated to the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Housing, Home Affairs, Defense. Yes. And yes. you are satisfied from your involvement in public life then that those statistics would show the uneven spending and there was no what you refer to as a mismanagement. And the social services sector was completely neglected. And that has caused the type of agitation which was coming up. It's the mismanagement of the economy, the misuse of public funds, the lack of accountability, the denial of human rights. All these things were happening at the same time. And that was what was causing the agitation and that was why people were responding. Because these were frontally being exposed by Rodney and others. Um, I recall clearly Major General McLean telling us not only the concept of the National Service was good, but it was productive. But you seem to be giving a different impression. He said they were producing lots of stuff. No, they weren't. They weren't? No, I'm saying that they, they're saying you produce or perish, but production had declined in almost every sector. The rice industry... No, no, I, I'm talking about National Service. Oh. Remember, Major General McLean was the head of the National Service yes. before he became General of, of the Army. Yeah. And he said it was a laudable concept, but they were producing. He talked about cotton, he talked about peanuts and, and many other things. Uh, but you are giving a different impression that they were taking the money from sugar and pumping it into a National Service and they were not producing. They were not producing anything. Are there any statistics available for us to see? Producing two pounds of Mong Dal and say that you're producing, the country is producing Mong Dal at a value of a million dollars, it's not production. They attempted several things. They attempted onions, they attempted Mong Dal, they had attempted on other crop when they said that they were going to bring and, 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 and produce crayfish, for example. So they pumped huge sums of money from the sugar industry into other crops and other division and it became zero. Absolutely nothing came out of it. Let me question you a little about what you refer to as the absence of accountability on the part of the government in relation to this, this spending in many areas. Under the Westminster type constitutions, and Guyana had one until the change of the constitution post the referendum, the job of the accountant general is to investigate the expenditure in each and every department. Sometimes it takes place two, three years later 
but he publishes his report. He calls permanent secretaries and senior officials before him. He exposes all those things. He's Respectfully, sir, do you mean the Auditor General? Sorry, sorry. What, what, what did I say? A Cognitive oh, General. I'm sorry, the Auditor General. Mm. And um, it is a very uh, troubling experience for those who have to appear before him, and many of them in order to protect themselves, especially if ministers overrule their advice, they are very careful sometimes to keep a separate copy of what they have written, which is not even on the file, or as a protective mechanism. Did the Auditor General, uh, did he, the Auditor General, did he operate here at that time? The Office of the Auditor General was operable, had limited staff, but there was no audit report. That is listed in our answer. It has been declared no audit report in this country for almost 10 years during that period. No auditor could have put their hands on any accounts. No one could dare. There was what we know and what is referred to as the paramountcy of the party. The party ruled the roost. So therefore, there are no statistics to support what you are saying? Where would those statistics be found? Pardon me? The statistics to support what you refer to as... The statistics, would, the be statistics found where? would lie in the allocation which was given, and the but in and the monitoring the allocation, whether the money went for those things or was used for that purpose is another matter. Well, that, those figures would be found in the estimate yes, it would on be the yearly basis. The former head of NASI testified of the gross mismanagement of economic resources with large sums expended on militarization while basic amenities and services were denied. He spoke of those opposed to the regime, including himself, having their vehicles sabotaged, making reference to a specific incident that occurred in 1979. First of all, tell us around what period was this? This is page four of your written statement. Earlier, you would recall, ma'am, that I did indicate about shortages and vehicles and the new vehicles or vehicles were not imported in the country, but those that are imported were going to government. Correct. Um, transportation was, we had severe shortage of transportation in the country at that time. And taxis were hardly around. It was only government buses. So persons wanting to move around, you either have your transportation or depend on that. So destroying opponents' vehicles was a norm. Mm -hmm. And you suffered And I found, and I fell a victim mm -hmm. of that, in that after the 1979 strike, just around September of 1979, I spoke at a public platform and two days after that, my vehicle ceased functioning. And it was a fairly reliable and good vehicle. Toyota don't give up easily. Mm -hmm. And when we took the vehicle, we had to tow it to the mechanic. When they opened the engine, it was completely destroyed. And the mechanic discovered that a sticky substance, believed to have been sugar, was poured into the engine. So that vehicle was rendered completely useless. We could not have brought it back. Where was the vehicle parked at the time when you discovered that it couldn't start? Well, we came from that meeting and I parked Which it. Which meeting? It, it was a meeting in the quarantine. Mm -hmm. We drove down. I parked the vehicle. We, we couldn't get crossing, by the way. We went over a fishing boat because the ferry had become very unreliable. And if you depend on the ferry, you have to wait four and five hours. So we parked the vehicle at Rosek Mall, took a fishing boat, crossed over to New Amsterdam, went to the meeting, came back, drove the vehicle. Who's we? You, you keep saying we. We left the vehicle. Oh, sorry. It was who, myself, who was in your company at that it time? It was myself, um, Leslie Melville. Yeah, but who was meeting? <coughs> Mm -hmm. Who's meeting? Who's meeting? meeting? Who sponsored the meeting? That's for union movement. NACI, CCW, GAU, and UGW. So representatives from the four union movement went up to the meeting. We went up with that vehicle. 
we had the Gao personnel in Barbies picking us up, taking us after we cross. Came back, the vehicle was intact. Drove it down and parked it at 64 High Street, Kingston. The next morning, tried to start it, and I found the laziness. I thought it was the battery, so I left it because I didn't have anything to do outside of the office. And the following morning, when I tried to start it, it sounded funny. I turned it and I turned it, and I think in the process, I may have damaged it by that because the sugar started to act. Where and, was the but sugar? I didn't know that it was sugar. Where was the sugar? What was the diagnosis of the mechanic? What did he tell you that was? He said it was. It was a sticky, sticky substance believed to be sugar. The former trade unionist recalled that the paramountcy of the PNC was widespread, even at the trade union level. Dr. Gopal, as we are going through your statement, we're now at paragraph 17. And you indicated in paragraph 17 that by 1979, the union movement became more militant after their right to collective bargaining had been denied. You said the PNC government used several methods of manipulation of delegates to ensure trade unions were under the control of the government. Could you care at this point in time to elaborate on this particular aspect of your statement? What were the methods of manipulation used in relation to the delegates of the unions? The trade unions which were affiliated to the ruling People's National Congress, in fact, that became a policy of the party arising out of the 1975 Congress. The 1975 Congress which party are you talking about? The People's National Congress, the ruling party then, yes. indicated that they must ensure the trade unions become friendly and be affiliated to them, and those who aren't must be viewed differently. And so a number of unions at that point in time, the Guyana Labor Union, the Guyana Public Service Union, the Guyana Teachers Union, the Amalgamated Transport, they're all listed in page 198 of my book. The Guyana Postal and Telecommunication Workers, the Guyana Mine Workers, the General Workers Union, the Union, were all affiliated to the People's National Congress then. They became affiliated, they declared their loyalty, and it was part of the process of bringing them in line with the party's philosophy. And out, arising out of the workshop, the following had been decided, and this has been reported because we've had the documents reported by the TUC to us, that during this period, unions should make funds available annually for education of workers in programs approved by the state. Two, the punitive measures should be meted out to party members who support trade unions whose aims and objectives are not consistent with the revolutionary movement. Salaried unionists, that is like myself, should be phased out because this encourages such leaders in supporting unjust demands by workers. Trade unions operating in the public sector must be affiliated to the ruling party since unions not affiliated can undermine the aims and objectives of the party and the government. An industrial relations bill should be introduced through unions affiliated to the party and the party should establish a system to determine the necessity for strike action. And it is incumbent on all party members to ensure that trade unions are affiliated to that, the party. Non-affiliated members whose members belong to the party should, through the executive of that union, urge affiliation. So the paramountcy was spreading to trade unions. These trade unions, which were affiliated, 
were then given <clears throat> finances by the Ministry of National Mobilization. And they had inflated their membership at the level of the TUC to gain more delegates. So financially, paper unions, unions that had 28 members and these sort of things, because the rules were manipulated in such a way, were paid for by the Ministry of National Mobilization. They entered the conference with greater voting strength. Question by the commissioners about the infiltration of the judicial system by the PNC, Dr. Gopal said the party made no bones in asserting its paramountcy. Assistant Lead Counsel to the Commission, Lachma Rahmat, summed up the day's proceedings. Today we saw Dr. Ananda Gopal enter the witness box. He is, of course, our present Minister of Labor. He gave evidence in relation to his experience coming from the angle of being a member of NASI, which was one of the leading trade unions operating between the period 1978-1980. He has given us a wealth of information in relation to how the circumstances prevailing between the period 1978-1979 impact upon the workers the sugar workers in particular, and the general Guyanese population living during that time. What I find instructive is his description of what was operating in relation to the bans placed on food items. He gave a description in terms of these bans and these restrictions on the importation of basic food items being used by the government of the day and by that regime as a method of control, controlling the population, controlling the state, and to entering into the lives of everyone present in Guyana at that time. What he indicated is basic items such as flour, oil, dal, None of these items were available. They were banned. If you were fined with the contraband, if they found any of these items on you, then you were charged. He also indicated that it is not that these items were not non-existent in Guyana, but that the items were given to the elite, given to the party favorites. In other words, if you were against the party, if you did not like what was happening and you spoke out against the oppression, you were victimized also by being deprived of these basic food items. And he said that many children went to school hungry. He even spoke about sugar workers and why it is they prefer to have roti as opposed to rice. And this is a perspective I do not think anyone ever really give thought to that workers working these hours cutting cane would prefer to have roti or items made from flour which would not spoil as quickly as rice. And when you have rice, it spoils faster in a matter of hours. And then if you, your food is spoiled, if you have to eat within a certain hour, then you're unable to work the long hours that you normally would have worked had you had the proper sustenance to be able to give you the energy to be able to do the amount of work that you normally did. This Guyana man that first came on the record when Mr. McLean gave his evidence, we saw a different perspective of whether the Guyana National Service was actually doing good for the country between the periods 1978-1980. Dr. Nanda Gopal offered the opinion that production was coming to a standstill. It was his experience and he's saying that basically what was happening is that there were so many restrictions on the food items, on importation, that even though you were supposed to produce and use your own, how were you to produce if you did not have the equipment that were necessary in the production process? Because a lot of the agricultural equipment he's saying when they did normal wear and tear and they broke down, they required parts. And even the importation of these parts was banned. You couldn't find the parts in Guyana to fix the machinery. So the machinery broke down. So you no longer had the machinery to assist in the production process. And therefore he's saying gradually what happened is production was coming to a, a screeching halt. 
This is significant because all the time we have been hearing evidence in relation to the political climate. But what Dr. Gopal offers us also is evidence in relation to some of the economic hardship that was facing Guyanese and sugar workers at that time. He also spoke in depth about the industrial action that was taken by the sugar workers in addition to other unions who in solidarity with NASI stood up and striked for workers' rights. And these stemmed from the 135 day strike that occurred between 1977 and extended into 1978. And during this period, he said 82 workers from the Guyana Stores Limited were fired because they striked, they joined the strike. He also indicated that victimization of workers um, who joined the industrial action occurred in different forms. Those who were not fired on the spot were actually acting in positions before the strike, saw that their acting positions were terminated. He said those who were actually working with these organizations and within the government and did in fact support the workers' rights, saw that eventually some of their rights were being taken away and they were being victimized in various ways which sometimes led to them being fired or making circumstances so oppressive that they themselves might have left the job. We also saw him talking about the industrial action that was taken in 1979. What is important to note is that between the 135 day strike and the 1979 strikes that the NASI was personally involved in, the root of what caused the industrial action goes back to governmental decisions that directly affected the workers. Because in the 135 day strike, what Mr. Gopal said happened was that the government had implemented a system where the, the sums of money that the sugar industry generated, there was a levy on this sum that the government obtained. The sums that were taken from the sugar industry were then distributed to other industries in the government. And he's saying that sometimes they were distributed to industries that you never saw anything materializing. He said a lot of money went into the national service and said they said they were producing cotton, but he never saw any cotton. And he drew to the commissioner's attention that if you're going to invest a million or a hundred million dollars in something and only produce two pints or two pounds of something, then that could not be cost effective and that could not be termed production. But in fact, you would be losing money that way.